Well, I love the idea of folks coming from CRISPR-Con into um, a talk by Andrew Flax. Hi, everybody. I'm Nora Hahn. I've uh, been part of the genetic engineering and society world since its founding and super happy today to introduce my fellow anthropologist, Andrew Flax. Um, I put Andrew on Todd's radar as the organizer of this awesome series because this summer I read Andrew's book, Cultivating Knowledge, and I thought uh, Andrew's going to be perfect for us all. Uh, so Andrew's coming to us from Purdue University where he teaches in anthropology got his degree at Wash St. Louis uh, back in 2016, held a postdoc at Carl Jasper Center for Advanced Transcultural Studies at Heidelberg. Uh, but it isn't his illustrious uh, background that I want you to know about. I was thinking Andrew is perfect for genetic engineering in society because all of us in this room um, share an interest in people's well-being. Uh, we go about this in different ways. We've got a lot of different disciplines uh, and interdisciplinary perspectives represented. But I think if there's one thing that unites us, it's well-being. But for most of us, we're thinking about that well-being from an upstream position of creating policies, of creating seeds and agricultural products. And Andrew's going to talk to us pretty firmly from a downstream position. What do those things really actually look like in people's everyday lives? Uh, the other reason I really wanted Andrew to be here was because here uh, at the GES Center, we pride ourselves in being a neutral space to talk about GM products and other kinds of products. But very rarely do we actually get to put the two side by side where we can have a full throated comparison. Um, Andrew Flax is a student of Glenn Stone. Some of you might remember Glenn who visited us a number of years ago. We had a pretty spirited discussion following uh, Glenn's visit around the problem of identifying a counterfactual. Um, here in the United States, it's really difficult to do that because really GM, cotton GM, uh, soy GM, corn has uh, effectively flooded the market. So where do we find a counterfactual? Uh, Andrew's gonna bring that to us. And then let's see. Um, finally, um, I want to say that our program, I think, has a strong interest in the arts and the creative uh, visuals that go along with the GM world. So uh, Andrew has a really awesome website. I'm going to send it all to you in the chat. Um, please look at it at one o'clock when he's done talking. Don't start now because you're going to get really pulled in. He's got lots of awesome stuff in there. And for those of you teaching, you're going to want to use it in your classroom. All right. With that, I will hand it over to Andrew. Thanks, Norris, so much for that great introduction. Um, I really loved how you how you positioned this talk as well. I would absolutely echo that. There are lots of really terrific ways to study these issues. We need all of them. I happen to be an anthropologist, and so my intellectual bias is on the social side of things, the lived experience of these kinds of technologies. Um, the context is what makes it all happen. But that's not to say that that's the only possible way that we could understand such a complex issue of like feeding the world and making farming a productive enterprise that people would want to be part of. So, so I love this, uh, this approach to taking all, all sorts of different sides. Hey, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm Andrew Flax from Purdue University. My work is broadly about sustainable food and agriculture systems. Recently finished uh, a book project on one key aspect in sustainability, looking at farmer decision-making, how people learn and make decisions about environmental management using genetically modified and organic cotton seeds in India as a case study there. Uh, I do other kinds of work as well. I've worked in, in Bosnia looking at heritage food systems and climate change, as well as in the U.S. Midwest, working with new American farmers and fermentation revivalists. But of course, we're here to talk, to talk about GMOs uh, in India. So I know that this is an interdisciplinary room. Uh, I'm a cultural anthropologist, and that means that my research is concerned primarily with what people do in the places where they live. And because of that, you're now looking at my lab. This is where my research takes place, Somla's house. It's next to his farm. His grandkid is sticking his hands in his mouth by being really cute, uh, and that's interrupting my study. And this is what my carefully controlled experimental scientific world looks like. 
I'm first and foremost an ethnographer. Uh, and that means that I take part in the events that I observe and describe and analyze over a long period of time. In my case, for this India project that I'm going to be talking about, that was 16 months over five trips to live in rural Telangana uh, in South India, 2012 to 2018. And when you take that basic approach to collecting data, you're also giving people rides. You are playing with the village kids, you are getting invited to weddings, and you are praying that you don't break the tractor when you're out in farmer's fields. At least, you know, that's what, what mine looks like. And this ethnography is how you lay the groundwork for asking bigger questions. In my case, about how new technologies like GM crops and organic agriculture affect people's lives. This is a different way of knowing about agriculture than the experimental field trial that's pictured here, where you can isolate and compare variables in experimental settings. And these are beautiful plants, delicately cared for by a loving agricultural economics PhD student who is soon going to know with great certainty which of these hybrids most effectively converts nitrogen into economic seed heads. Really important information to know. Uh, but from my perspective, from my bias, it's missing something kind of important because there aren't any farmers in this picture. Farmers who are living their busy, messy, complicated lives, ignoring breeder instructions, getting competitive with their neighbors, trying to save money, and above all, trying to be good farmers as they see it. Here's another kind of controlled setting, an NGO sponsored farm being documented by a local news story. Anthropologists, development workers, reporters, documentary filmmakers, we all have seen scenes like this where our key informants and our fixers and our gatekeepers, these people who jump up at every opportunity and try really hard in these systems, come and talk to us. And if you're a trained social scientist, you know to be kind of cautious in taking these people's experiences as universal. In the development, corporate, and journalistic worlds, these charismatic and engaged folks are often asked to share their experiences to illustrate the potential of some kind of new technology or intervention. Their experiences are very real, uh, but they're not always representative or even realistic. We're still kind of in that world of the experimental field trial, a condition artificially set up by groups that have some kind of strong interest, be it the pro-business Monsanto, now Bayer, or the lefty environmentalist magazine here, Down to Earth. This can reach kind of absurdist moments if you're an anthropologist studying agricultural life. Uh, you're looking at a wax model. It's labeled typical Indian village. This is at the International Center for Research in the Semi-Arid Tropics. Uh, this is a, a reformed CG center, about an hour outside of Hyderabad, India. It's about a 10 minute walk from an actual Indian village. And so these field trials, these carefully cultivated show farms, these wax models of agrarian life, I'm gonna be arguing today that these are kind of poor predictors for the lived behavioral phenomena that we see in agrarian life. And that's because they abstract away too much of that real life stuff that structures how people make decisions, what I'm most interested in. That real life stuff is what anthropologists are all about. We're an aggressively empirical uh, and often a very present focused discipline. The data, the conclusions that I have, they're drawn from my empirical field work where I was looking at performance and practice. What is it that people do? And so if you're studying knowledge, at the end of the day, you have to triangulate lots of different perspectives to get at what is it people know and how do they know it? Biodiversity, individual stories, market performances, spatial variables, aggregated decision-making. Um, and I use a number of tools to do so, but always situating these within that ethnography, within the lived experience of people making decisions. The issue at hand in my work is that a seed is a choice that cannot be taken back. On cotton farms in India, this seemingly simple decision about you know, which seed you're going to plant has taken center stage in a much larger debate over two mutually exclusive visions for the future of agriculture, genetically modified organisms and certified organic farming. And so by looking at how cotton farmers learn about their seeds and put that knowledge to use, we're in a position now to look at these local impacts of the global changes, the slow persistent dangers of pesticides, rural inequality, the aspirations of people who grow fibers sent around the world, the place of ecological knowledge, the complex threat of suicide, fundamentally, as Nora said, well-being. It all begins with a seed. About a third of the cotton that's grown on earth is grown in India. Since around 2008, 95% of that or so has been genetically modified to be resistant to Lepidopteran caterpillars, in part because commercial 
Cotton in India is a hybrid of Gossypium hirsutum that is susceptible to Asian and American bollworms. And in part, because that cotton is grown in monocultures under the conditions of a very specific rural neoliberal capitalism. Farming is a fairly public activity. You're essentially on a stage where you perform all kinds of complex ideas about living a good life. Anthropology revels in these kinds of complexities, like the teenager still in his school uniform here picking organic cotton. Advocates of a certain flavor of productivist, productivist agriculture might see this as proof that we need more mechanization. If you're fair trade international, you're furious with this photo. This might be child labor. If you're an agrarian studies scholar, or if you grew up on a farm, you probably recognize this as an after school chore. I say, let's look at how these systems are put into action because this is a great way to understand what happens on farms here in the 21st century. So to get at this question of rural well-being and agrarian change, I was looking at these two mutually exclusive technologies, both offering a vision of sustainability and talking with the people who grew them over this period of around 16 months, 2012 to 2018, culminating in a lovely book I'd love everyone to buy several copies of. Uh, much of my research since 2012 has been asking how GM seeds and organic certification might help resource poor farmers live the kinds of lives they wanna live. So these solutions are mutually exclusive for legal reasons. No one who plants a GM seed can sell their products internationally as certified organic products. And so nobody really tries to grow GM seeds under organic conditions without chemical fertilizers or pesticides. India is a good place to look at this. We're talking about around 600 million small farmers dependent on agriculture and many thousands of private, public, and NGO programs trying to fix that agriculture, in part because Indian agriculture is often talked about as if it's in crisis. Uh, lots of reasons that this is so, some of which are have a colonial logic to them. Uh, but in the 1990s, India was dealing with low productivity per farm, generational poverty, pest attacks, and relatively high numbers of farmer suicide. Cotton sector was particularly hard hit at this time. Cotton in the 1990s accounted for almost half of the pesticides used in India, even though it was planted on only 5% of the agricultural land. These pesticides were and continue to be expensive and they're dangerous. The most common form of farmer suicide is to drink pesticide. It is a horrible way to die. Crisis surrounding pesticide use and pest attacks became this kind of rallying cry for NGOs and corporations looking for solutions. But of course, that downstream anthropological question is, okay, what lives are possible now on these farms? How do interactions with these technologies influence rural well-being and sustainability? We could look at the GM seeds or insects and talk about them as factors for this agrarian crisis. We might celebrate technologies or new programs as a means to empower rural economies. I've, I really think that puts the focus though in the wrong place because it leads us to these technological solutions that aren't getting at the heart of the problem. So for what it's worth, I would argue that the biggest impact of technologies like GM cotton and organic certification is in the ways that they are transforming how farmers learn and practice farm work. Since 2012, I've been working in nine villages in Telangana. That's a state in India's Southern Cotton Belt where agricultural development has been relatively slow compared to the rest of the country. If we look at the adoption of genetically modified BT cotton seeds, it's swift and overwhelming. Commercially introduced in 2002, more than 95% of all the cotton now planted is BT. And that's due in part to this tremendous marketing push and investment by a multinational private sector in a traditionally public and heavily subsidized market. If you're a farmer in Telangana, it is virtually impossible to find a non-BT seed in the shop. But, these national averages miss a fairly important part of that story because since 2002, there have been more than a thousand new seeds released. Right now we're looking at around 1400 seeds, meaning that while almost all cotton farmers are using GM cotton seeds, deciding which particular seed you're going to use is very difficult to do. The actual on-farm story is fairly complicated. If we look at percentages of people who are buying particular seed brands, we can see that for about one year, one brand becomes really popular being bought by more than 40% of anyone who buys cotton in a given year. In 2012, more than 60% of the farmers who planted cotton planted this Niraja Dr. Brent seed, indicated here by that green line, before largely abandoning it by 2014. A mystery. Why, would, why do we see this behavior? 
One possible hypothesis is that the best technology rises to the top, a kind of a simplistic economic rationalism, but a hypothesis we can test. Might sound like kind of a straw man argument to a qualitative social scientist. It kind of is. People rarely make these totally rational decisions. But these arguments, as you can see here, get brought up again and again in policy and in economic circles. And they've got far more influence on these debates than I do. So I say, let's take them seriously. There's an assumption here that the variability that we see these overall trends of aggregated seed choices are the result of a series of well-informed individual choices. If the best technology rises to the top, and if one of these brands is truly superior, then these spikes represent people figuring that out. This is a question we can test with surveys that ask about policymakers' main obsession and farmers' key stated motivation, yield response. I don't know if uh, everyone here works with box plots, um, but when you measure farmer yields and you place them here into this statistical measure of how different and similar things are, essentially everything's the same. There is no statistically significant difference between the yields for any of these extremely popular seeds. And anyway, there's not all that much time to learn. This is a histogram, a measure of how much a population does something. Here, plant their seeds for multiple years. Farmers on average plant their cotton seeds for about a year and a half before they switch to something new. And this means that most farmers are switching their seeds so quickly, they don't have enough time to learn about any particular seeds performance in the field. Farmer knowledge suffers under these circumstances when asked to make predictions about their seeds, even for really important phenotypic factors, like how big your cotton bowl is going to be, something that has a downstream impact on labor costs. Will this plant be bushy or tall? A phenotypic factor that has to do with how closely you need to plant these seeds. Farmers gave a huge spread of answers. I don't know was often as likely an answer about seed choice is anything else. Answers with over 50% agreement are highlighted here in the cells. This is not because people aren't doing experiments and or they're not keeping track of differences between their seeds. Here you're looking at two farms side by side. I asked the farmer on the left which seed was better and he started laughing at me. What, you can't see? Look how much thicker and fuller and greener my seed is than my neighbor's seed. And yet the following year he switched to something new. This is maybe another interesting moment of why it's fun to be an anthropologist studying agriculture. I just showed you like four slides of negative results. Hooray! Because that means that we need some qualitative ethnographic data to make sense of this signal. Fundamentally, the story's not that complicated. This is a really difficult choice to make and people have a really hard time learning given all of these different possibilities because this is what we wind up with. No reliable source of information by the, from the field, not from our yields, not from farmer experience with seeds, no shared agreement on what these seeds are going to be. Remember, this is the first thing you do. This is a path dependent decision that sets in motion everything else for the rest of the season. When mapped across two villages here, where each map that you're looking at shows the spread of one fad seed across two key villages, you're seeing more dots in the same color over time, a sign that people are increasingly likely to choose what everybody else is choosing in the hopes that the group as a whole has got it right. What we don't see is any single person who's always getting it right, because then we would see these rippling, uh, these ripples of increasingly red dots out from central points. When we modeled this pattern through space using a stepwise logistic regression model, we found that there is no connection between someone's yields and what they planted, no connection between someone's yields and what their nearest neighbor planted. People who planted a given seed were significantly less likely to plant that seed in the future. The number one predictive factor about whether or not you are going to plant something is if your nearest neighbor planted it, regardless of yield, regardless of response. Sheer presence in your nearest neighbor's field. There's a social geography here too at work. Men are the main people making decisions about what to buy. There are no men in this picture. This is hired female labor that does most of the weeding and the picking, meaning that the men buying seeds are often one step removed from the daily work of managing cotton in a way that builds nuanced environmental knowledge. In rural South India, there are also caste relationships that intersect with wealth and generational uh, access to resources. These die hard. Many laborers will copy the choices of a larger landlord or simply ask them to bring back whatever they think is best. The reverse, where a high caste landlord might ask his day laborer for seed advice, that's unthinkable 
in this social geography. So these are influences of space, a prestige bias of these high status people, a lack of information across gender lines, ambiguous field-based information. That's already enough, but this sense of anxiety and confusion can be traced to the market itself. The advertising is intense. It's on the buses, it's covering the roads, it's hanging over the shops. It creeps in during news broadcasts. Here it is covering the face of the prime minister during an election year. In a given shop, you're likely to find around 50 different seed brands and between shops, you'll find hundreds. Consumer scientists call this phenomenon choice overload. When there's too many choices and no good way to separate them, a lot of people decide to go with the crowd or to copy the choice of someone who is socially important. And don't start feeling superior, audience. This happens with really high stakes decisions in North America when employees at corporate offices and universities, including MIT, NYU, and Yale, when they're offered dozens of complicated retirement plans, they become anxious, choice overwhelmed. And we all ask our HR reps to do this for us, even when that leads us to find the plans that are way better for our employers than they are for us as employees. So seed choice is paradoxically crucial yet uncertain. Among cotton farmers, we have a sense of anxiety in choosing well to provide for our family, an inclination to look to others in authority to make that decision for us. A general hope that the crowd as a whole has got it right. Except what kind of choice is this in a context of unstable knowledge and indiscernible options? It's not really a choice at all. Despite not knowing what seed you should plant, farmers still have to justify their decisions to one another, save face and brag. Tell, telling anyone that they're choosing these seeds because manchi de gubari anakuntananam. In Telugu, I'm hoping for a good yield. Obvious answer for a cash crop. Yet that stated hope for good yield presses all kinds of hopes. The hope to stay on your land the hope to pass your land on to your children, the hope to make good choices, ultimately to live well. And it compresses all that into this language of agribusiness. Because for most farmers, that GM seed is one of the worst ways that they can accomplish these goals, at least from a stability perspective. As part of the lives of cotton farmers, these seeds are limiting the futures that can be imagined by growers, decreasing this aspect of agricultural knowledge in a moment of agrarian distress. This new normal of farming is masking very deep ambivalence about what it means to farm well. And the push to gloss all of this as the search for good yields frames us essentially within this language of policymakers, individual choices, and agribusiness. The system works really well at selling seeds and associated impacts. It has been incredibly effective in having farmers adopt this new technology. How well it works to solve an agrarian crisis, far more difficult question. So what if instead of being left to sink or swim in an open market, you've got this strong institution that limits how you can learn? This is often the case in the alternative development of organic farming. Very much like GMOs, organic agriculture might provide some answers to this agrarian crisis, in this case through alternative marketing. But the story's complicated. Organic ag might help some farmers in some cases. That's true of GM seeds as well, but it's not a panacea. And to understand that, we have to look at how people learn. Because on organic farms, often their success or failure tends to hinge on these strategic choices that farmers are making to follow prescribed instructions and the construction of a new kind of agricultural stage where they can perform this well being to their neighbors. So, Organic ag is small compared to the world of GM cotton farming, and yet organic uh, Indian agriculture is still providing around half of all the organic cotton that's in the market today. This is an international supply chain. Domestic demand is very low. And so this supply chain depends heavily on trust, meaning that organic agriculture has rules. It draws on a kind of an audit culture, even when it's not technically certified. Recall GM farmers were really obsessed with yield chasing. And so it's important to note here that the yields are way better on GM farms and on the organic farms where I was working. Now, a lot of this is contextual. These are villages that are recruited for the, in the first place because they're on bad land, they're on marginal land, they're far away from resources, they're full of people who are historically marginalized. But this is a pretty obvious and dramatic difference. So if the rules are strict and the returns are low, farmers need some kind of reason to stick with this program. And that incentive often comes through material rewards that underwrite agricultural vulnerability. 
Farmers get free seeds, but they also get equipment and loans and consultations. A lot of them are directly employed by these programs. One of the great fringe benefits of working with this group, uh, with these kinds of organic development projects, is that the intervention steps in and does paperwork for you. It connects farmers to interest-free loans and seed cleaning machines and irrigation pumps, stuff they're eligible for, but to actually get, they would have had to sit in bureaucratic offices for months. And the upstroke of this is more than just material stuff. These farmers become local celebrities. They're on the news. They're on Facebook. They're on television. Once in a while, they get to meet visiting members of Congress and more importantly, Tollywood movie stars. Tollywood being the Telugu language uh, Hollywood. In alternative agriculture programs throughout South India, development groups working in a new area will first choose influential farmers as a way of establishing credibility. And the backing of people like this helps to build rapport in villages that are chosen because they're poor, isolated, or in need of development. So this is convenient for a project manager who can work with fewer farmers at a time. It's also convenient for a visitor who can see this village through the eyes of this particularly charismatic person. Sometimes these same people, because they learn how to present themselves to crowds or interested visitors, come to represent the village or even organic agriculture or even India as a whole in wider media. Same guy. Media celebrations of these particularly charismatic people can give that impression that it's organic regulation or even it's organic clothing consumption in Europe, North America, and Japan that is the thing that helps these farmers. And here we run into another downstream anthropological problem because that story ultimately hides the crucial efforts of NGOs and organic companies and charismatic farmers in underwriting all this vulnerability and building social capital. It hides the effects of these ambitious, opportunistic and earnest local people who are taking up this cause. That relationship is critical. That's what makes these interventions sustainable or it grinds them to a halt because these charismatic farmers are also local enforcers. They are trialers. They build networks of support and they ground truth agricultural management. This illusion is especially troublesome to me because it's hiding away these performative aspects that make these farms work. So if we're here because we're interested in building resilient environmental relationships through daily practice, we wanna celebrate these institutions and relationships, not pretend that they're not here. This is how this stuff works. The takeaway here is not these spaces are performative and so they are therefore illegitimate. It's completely the opposite. The ways that organic programs underwrite vulnerability, create social capital, create new reward structures, that's what makes them sustainable. In other studies, farmers list their suspicion that organic programs won't follow through on their promises as a number one deterrent to joining up with these groups and for good reason. Rural India is full of forgotten commitments to development. Farmers have learned that they can reap a short-term benefit from a project that needs a short-term deliverable, like a one-year study or a mural on village empowerment. But by leaning into the performative aspects of these farm works, institutions stand a better shot at helping farmers build a sustainable agriculture. The lack of that engaged audience has left other Telangana cotton farmers exposed to this free market and bereft of these social and economic support systems. So some concluding thoughts, right? I would hope that we'd agree that this is not a very sophisticated question. Of course, GM crops and organic agriculture works sometimes for some people under the right circumstances. If we're just interested in yields, GM crops mostly work, organics do not. I think that's a fairly poor way to assess the larger impacts on well-being of these agrarian technologies. Since 1995, as I mentioned earlier, there's been this epidemic of farmer suicides. At this point, over 300,000 people have died by drinking pesticides, brought on from the desperation of being unable to pay back high interest loans that farmers take out to afford cotton seeds, fertilizers, and pesticides. Uh, by the way, not just farmers, there are also epidemics of suicide among middle-level managers and white-collar professions, as well as among students. This is telling us, at least in the agrarian sector, that there is a crisis here between aspiration, what you are hoping to do, uh, and the kind of person you imagine yourself to be, and especially in these farming situations, the kind of man. There's a, this is a crisis in many ways of masculinity here, of being unable to provide in the way and to live in the land in the way that you want to live. 
Uh, the government initially offered a 50,000 rupee compensation about at the time a year's income to uh, proven victims of farmer suicides. They've recently pulled back from this as rural communities began counting every death as a farmer suicide, an issue of measurement that we don't really have time to get into right now. Um, suffice it to say, suicides don't really have very much at all to do with BT cotton. There's no data that supports this connection. I mean, the graphs are like T's when we see adoption versus suicide. Why this is relevant is that this is still being marshaled in these arguments, either pro or against GM crops. Both sides of the GM debate will claim these suicides for themselves. Anti-GM folks point to the reliance on expensive seeds, which isn't really the most expensive part of this, uh, as well as fertilizers and manipulation by multinational companies. Pro-GM folks will say that this crop reduces pesticide investment costs, helps to defeat these bugs. Um, Really, the truest thing we can say is that farmers are still committing suicide. And that's mostly for that social reason. Cotton farming is difficult, especially for communities experiencing generational poverty and disenfranchisement who don't have great access to things like credit or water infrastructure that would make them more productive. It's getting harder to live the kind of life you wanna live as a small farmer. And that disconnect between your aspirations and what is possible right now can be really devastating. Recent exhaustive study by Gutierrez et al. Uh, concludes that cotton works well for some farmers with irrigation. It works less well for farmers without irrigation. And those people who are most at risk for suicide are the smallest and poorest farmers who spend the most on agriculture. That shouldn't be so surprising to us if we're comfortable seeing ecology and agriculture as cultural, social, and political. Poor, Marginalized people don't get as many of the benefits of a new technology. And yet this obvious truth can get lost if we get trapped into seeing agriculture as technological rather than social. You know, much is made of, of how GMOs have raised yields in India. The yield story is fairly complicated when we look at it over time. Certainly more farmers sowed more cotton uh, and India as a nation went from being the fourth largest cotton producer to number one. Now it's jockeying back and forth with China. But on individual fields, the story is complicated. Um, as you can see, more and more people are planting BT cotton across the country, uh, and yet yields recently have stayed about the same. There's a huge increase just after 2001, uh, but that jump comes at a really funny time because the adoption of these new seeds during that big jump in uh, cotton yields, it's actually quite low, it's under 6%. By the time that most farmers are actually planting BT seeds in their, in their fields uh, after 2008, our yields have started to go down. They've essentially plateaued here. Now that we can't find non-BT seeds at most Telangana shops, we've still got uh, a plateau of yields that's far below the productivity of India's main cotton competitors in China and in the United States. Final point here, one that's less ambiguous. BT cotton is supposed to reduce pesticide applications. Remember, this is a crop planted on 5% of the land. It accounted for half the sprays. We can see that pesticide sprays clearly drop when BT cotton is fully adopted in 2002. But since 2008, this period when most farmers are planting this technology, sprays for non-target pests, sucking pests are, are jacids, white flies, and aphids, who are not affected by the BT protein have climbed back up. And actually now total pesticide levels are at even greater numbers than what they were before. This is a very optimistic village mural. It reads in Telugu, Syngenta mine in hours. It advises people to stay out of the, uh, to keep their kids out of the field until they're 15 and to always wear their spray gear. But that is of course not the reality of spraying cotton which has serious consequences for people who spray now more pesticides than before the introduction of this pesticide reducing technology several times a season in full tropical heat. It doesn't always matter what the pest populations are in a given field because one has to be seen by one's neighbors to be spraying and caretaking. This is what it means to, to perform being a good responsible farmer on that public stage of the field. One farmer explained this to me as, if my neighbor sprays four times, I have to spray five. This does not mean that farmers are stupid. This means that agriculture is social. 
and there are consequences to that. This person is going to be exposed to these sprays during the hours that it takes to walk his land. Both he and the largely young and largely female labor force of weeders and pickers are exposed to these persistent pesticides during crop management. These chemicals blow into groundwater and well systems, and these same sprays will persist on their foods. Important to keep in mind here, everyone who worked on BT cotton predicted that this would happen. Anytime you introduce a new technology that's aimed to knock out an apex predator in a niche, the arbol worms, you're going to have a spike and a new niche that's going to be filled by something else. This was never supposed to solve all pesticide sprays forever. But because of the ways that this technology was implemented and the ways that farmers sowed it in their fields, these are the consequences, the empirical realities that we wind up with. Uh, so look, social scientists like myself has, have a duty to measure and critique in our explanation of social and environmental systems. I'm interested in how, why, and under what circumstances farmers learn and have meaningful lives as cotton farmers. Um, I don't want to fully equivocate here. One of the best interventions uh, is a cooperative, whether it's organic or not. A group of people that can help organize seed decision-making, organize labor and resources in a very difficult line of work that is cotton agriculture. Cooperatives incentivize different sets of ways to be successful in an agricultural sector where GM cotton farming, farmers are internalizing their failures and committing suicide. Um, there are some great successful cooperatives in places where, where I've worked that sell genetically modified seeds. It's clear as well that all organic agricultural development programs that I met and talked with that have these international supply chains, they all work through cooperatives. In each case, sustainability is not a question of technology, but of social institutions and daily practices. At the end of the day, we're living in a five-year cotton glut. So if the point of agriculture is to sell seeds and inputs and to increase futures on cotton as a commodity traded on the global market, then we're doing great. If the point is to reduce toxic sprays and build rural community and to make cotton farming a more viable way of life, then we probably are going to continue needing more complicated solutions and simply increasing yields through specific seed technologies. Big part of that answer, at least from my work, is through cooperatives. And I can talk about that more questions and answers if you like. At this point, I'd like to really thank you all for listening to me. Um, Happy to talk more about this and other work associated with my book. My kid assures you it's delicious. Thanks for all your time. Okay, thanks so much, Andrew. And um, Todd, I saw you unmute there. Do you wanna handle the Q&A? Yeah, so just to remind everyone that if you use your raise hand function, we can uh, call on you and unmute you but also feel free to type in your questions in the chat box and we will get to as many as we possibly can. But first, I just want to thank you, Andrew, so much. This was a really fascinating talk um, and something we don't hear enough of, I think, in, in some of our conversations. So um, with that, I'm going to uh, unmute uh, Ramon and so you should be able to ask your question. Hi, can you hear me? I can, thanks. And I'm going to be looking a little bit off screen, so I, I apologize for the optics. Yeah, that's great. Um, thank you so much for that presentation. Uh, I am really enjoyed uh, how you frame the, the, the problems and challenges that farmers have to face. Um, more than a question is a comment and perhaps just seeking for your opinion. One of the things that when we look at this kind of interaction, social aspects associated with transgenic technologies in developing countries, many people come up with the idea that, as you said, it, it's, it's just a lack of training or a lack of education about how to handle all these uh, options. But I just wanna bring up to the table that it is exactly the same here in the United States. Um, our, our growers, use cotton varieties in average one and a half to two years, the same as those uh, growers in, in India. Um, the, the decision to plant is based on what their neighbors are saying and on what the sales rep is telling them that is the next wave of, of the best high yielding variety. So how do we 
take this argument that is is just a lack of proper education and training when we have the two extremes of technology suffering the, the people the farmers suffering the same challenges of course in a different context but I, I think that the, the decision making process is very similar yeah thanks uh, Ramon for that question nice to meet you um, I in general, I, I would completely agree. This is certainly not an issue just of um, small holding farmers in, in India. Um, and actually, I think there's a great deal of convergence here. And from my anthropological perspective, uh, the conclusion that I would draw here is that we are seeing that choice overload effect. We are seeing the transition uh, of a seed from a kind of a if you'll excuse some anthropological jargon, uh, we're seeing this transition from a seed uh, as a as a thing imbued with relational knowledge between people and uh, and between this specific knowledge that translates into economic things like the growth habit or the phenotypic characteristics of a seed, and we're seeing it move into the, this realm of being a a, a more pure commodity, uh, where knowledge of the thing itself, knowledge of its production, knowledge of its future actions uh, is very much just related to this kind of consumer good uh, idea. That's part of why I use the term, uh, and, and Glenn Stone, who was here, I guess, uh, a few years ago, it's part of why we're using this term fads, because this looks just a lot like any other branding cycle. Um, and if it's your job to sell seeds, and that's not so strange or weird to you, but if you're an agrarian studies scholar, the idea of treating seeds like any other kind of alienated globalized commodity is something quite new and different that severs um, through that process of commodification some of the relationships of knowledge and labor and practice that we might talk about. Um, so American farmers are very often in that same kind of situation uh, where they're choosing these seeds because of its commodified branded product. They're, that's their interaction with it as something that you would purchase. Um, Indian farmers are now doing the same thing. One interesting thing that we might notice is that rice is a very different crop. Rice is not a branded commodity for these exact same cotton farmers. Uh, rice choices are far more stable over time. Rice uh, agriculture is something that farmers know quite a lot more about um, and rice is planted over a period of time for far longer um, as, we're, as they're talking about this. Only 20% of rice choices we observed were first time plantings compared to almost half of rice of cotton seeds that were sown by the exact same people. And these differences manifest in a farmer population that has very nuanced rice knowledge that is fundamentally absent in the cotton sector. Same is also true um, of home garden crops. That is to say, my mother-in-law gave me these tomatoes and I am dead if I let them die. Um, those same kinds of relationships um, then translate into different kinds of ecological practices. And at least um, when we scale that up into between household crops, rice, um, and cotton, we get this, uh, what, we, what we've called a, co a commodification spectrum upon which um, knowledge and decision-making knowledge uh, and the commodification of that seed are inversely related. Um, I can put that we wrote a paper about this. I can put it in the chat if you're interested or just uh, send me a line. But there is this clear difference between the brandedness of the product and how people interface with it. Hey, I'm going to read a question from Jason Delborn in the chat. Um, it's around these cooperatives. So Jason is asking, what are the barriers to forming and participating in cooperatives if they seem to create the conditions for success, regardless of whether you want to plant GM or organic? Uh, great question. Um, institutional support is, is, I think, the cleanest possible way to answer that question. Uh, this is a cooperative meeting based in um, uh, a village, uh, one, of, one of the target villages that we studied. Um, the reason that this cooperative really exists is because there is... Uh, a person here uh, who is from a higher caste family, uh, their uncle was an agricultural extension officer and he kept coming back to the village and trying to figure out why it was that people weren't doing all of the extension advice as farmers you know, often do. They don't take the advice of extension officers even when asked. 
Um, and he decided to stay because he had that family connection. And that became an institutional buy-in. And between this uncle and extension and this particular uh, generationally wealthy family, they over a period of years formed this cooperative and tweaked interventions that worked best for them, talking through the complexities of the market um, and ultimately leading on this social institution that was centralizing knowledge through these collaborative meetings. Um, cooperative wasn't perfect. It was dominated by a generationally wealthy family. Um, some of the lower caste uh, and scheduled tribe, which is a different ethnic uh, group in South India, some of those people um, felt excluded because of that uh, makeup of this institution. Um, the people who were like the friends of the cooperative managers, uh, they like got these new interventions first and they kind of had the most flexibility with it. But I think this was an example of a rising tide that lifted all the boats here. That personal connection, that willingness to work through and ground truth uh, suggestions over a long period of time, that's what made it work. Same thing, I would argue, as what made some of these organic interventions successful. This willingness to put in the time to work with a target village or community and make decisions cooperatively rather than just paint that mural or do a study and kind of get out of there. Um, I've observed a number of organic programs that crash to the ground because people, the, the organic company and NGO was not interested in making those investments in particular local leaders or in a, a kind of a rural um, uh, a white collar professionalism, this like very low level manager. If those guys don't get paid on time, your cooperative is not gonna work because that they're the glue that really makes it logistically function. Um, so that institutional buy-in, that long-term effort, that's what seems to be the make or break factor here, whether it's organic or not. All right, great. Uh, Brad, you should be able to ask a question. Okay, uh, thank you. I loved your talk. It really showed, you know, the role of anthropology <clears throat> in understanding agricultural systems and really neat. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the beginning of your talk, you know, where you showed uh, those beautifully laid out plots and so on, <clears throat> and then talked about, you know, the anthropological thing, what was missing in those plots. Yes, <laughs> you get to those very well. Um, but I, I wanted to come back to, you know, something about our group is, is about the interdisciplinarity and teams and sort of different ways of knowing. And I was just sort of wondering, I mean, you really did rely on a lot of data, you know, outside of anthropology to look at pesticide use and fertilizer use. You know, if you were to go back, you know, if this study hadn't been done, how would you design a team to study the, these, these cotton-based agricultural systems in India? You know, who would be with you? I mean, that, that's so, thank you for that question. It's a fabulous question. Um, I honestly, I have always thought that the best work comes from combining all these different perspectives. I have here, you know, our, um, that elephant fable, right? Where we can touch all the different parts of it, but we still don't get the true story. And it's only through a holistic perspective that we see this. I think absolutely, um, if we're looking at cotton agriculture in the field, you need people who are trained in agronomy. Um, I myself, for some of the work that I did to do that spatial analysis, I had to partner with um, someone whose full-time work was GIS statistical management. Um, one cannot be a master in, in all things. So I think the anthropologist should be there. We, you need to have the toxicologists involved. I think an agricultural economist, it's absolutely necessary to, to keep track of uh, the sorts of models that we're working with. I want to have our entomologist in there to really be looking at the pest conditions and measuring that as best as we can. Um, you know, the question is as big as your, as your research will allow. Uh, Nora mentioned a, a recent project of mine, a digital humanities project, which was all about the commodity chain of cotton. And uh, one of the joys of creating that project was reaching out to people um, like Jonathan Wendell, who's a plant geneticist, uh, who's worked a lot on cotton, um, as well as archeologists and uh, other anthropologists, to people who work in the textile industry, to people who study fashion, and combining all these perspectives into this single, um, we use the Esri story map uh, uh, software to give this like very personal but expert driven uh, way of looking at the cotton supply chain 
with input from people with this wide variety of perspectives. So, I mean, Fred, as, pos as wide as possible, I would say, will give you the best information. Your data is always going to be better if you can combine, in this case, qualitative and quantitative approaches and different kinds of epistemologies. Um, an SDS person, like, a, you know, it'd be great to have a philosopher on, on the field as well to make sure that we're really thinking critically about what counts as a measurement. A huge issue, for example, with suicides. One of the big emotional topics I've talked about with this, um, everyone essentially agrees that small holding cotton farming done by people experiencing generational poverty, everyone can agree that that's hard. Exactly how we measure suicides is a real question fundamentally of measurement of how we think about numbers. Um, and so without that kind of critical perspective, we might miss something really important about how a suicide is counted. Great question, yeah. Uh, Dalton, go ahead and ask your question. Uh, hi there, Andrew. Great talk. Thank you so much for um, sharing this with us today. Um, so my question actually uh, goes back to the topic of cooperatives. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm in general just a, a bit, I'm interested in a bit, um, excuse me, I'm interested in hearing a bit more about how cooperative solutions in your experience work, are working against some of these key challenges that you have touched upon in your talk. Um, and I'm especially interested in knowing in what ways, if any, these farmer cooperatives are working against that internalization of failure that you've described that is um, so inherent to this problem of suicides. Thank you. Yeah, uh, great, great question. Lots to say about cooperatives. Again, you know, of course, the anthropologist, the social scientist loves a cooperative solution. Uh, but what, what I see working here, and here's a picture is the manager uh, of the cooperative shop in this village. It's his uncle who works in extension. Um, what I see happening here is a number of things all at different levels. First of all, you can see there's a fairly limited set of cotton seeds here. Um, so this is an artificial limiting of the true cotton market. So when a farmer comes in here, uh, they do not see 50 brands as they would in a normal seed shop, nor do they see the thousands, you know, hundreds really, but potentially thousands of seeds between shops. You've got a very limited set here. The farmers know this guy. He lives in the village. He's, he's kind of one of them, uh, even if he is, he does have some uh, ethnic and class distinction. Uh, this cooperative has a porch, and that might not sound like a big deal, but not a whole lot of small petty commodity shops in rural India have got these big porches with big awnings where the manager calls tea so that everybody can come and chat, hang out in a friendly space and talk about um, the weather and the news reporting and the seed reporting that they get in their newspapers. Um, the anthropologist Stephen Lansing talked about the influence of these water temples in Bali, where everyone kind of get together and talk about their planting decisions and the ways in which that had these downstream effects of um, pest management and water management that were in many ways disrupted by a green revolution, uh, spray everything kind of approach in the 60s and 70s. I think that this cooperative provides the space where those kinds of social interactions can happen. In addition to some more um, heavy handed moves like limiting the seeds that are available here. Every year he talks with extension. They call their buddies in private and public sectors. They try to figure out which seeds are best suited to the particular land qualities of the village where the seed, seed shop is. And those are the seeds that they carry. Farmers can go off and get other stuff if they want to, uh, but that's kind of what's here and available. You can see as well on the top shelf, um, he's probably displaying a couple of recent awards. Um, this cooperative has been like endorsed by the state and it's also been endorsed by local farmers groups. So that makes a big difference. These are people that have seen the successes here year after year and they come to trust it. It's this return of trust uh, in a market that overall has really lost trust. Um, Ron Herring, uh, the agricultural economist at Cornell described this initially as um, anarcho-capitalism, which I think is a fair description of, of how this seed may lay goes. Here we've got a limited version of it that's a bit more scientifically based and cooperatively decided. Um, one, one great example of how they instilled this trust in 2012, there was a seed shortage of key seeds that farmers wanted to plant. The state solved this problem by issuing seed permits. One hour after seed permits were issued, there was a thriving black market for seed permits and other seeds. Instant 
um, naivety on the part of the state. This cooperative called everybody in and had a meeting. They decided to democratically distribute the seeds to pool some of their cooperative share money and to reduce the cost of the seeds that were going to be sold there to make sure that everybody got a fair shot. After that, you're going to trust this group of people. And so that's like a long-term, if a bit idiosyncratic way uh, to return trust to this market through really a key institution that provides space for democracy, for cooperative decision-making. Um, one or two of the pitfalls, as I mentioned, um, the, the people who run this cooperative are the generational landlords. And if you feel excluded from that, you might not be super comfortable coming in and asking them for a bunch of favors. If you want to use the seed cleaning machine, you have to go to uh, the gentleman in white. You have to go to his house. And if you're not on good terms with him or you don't feel comfortable speaking your mind to this guy, you might have some interpersonal differences there. So it's not perfect, right? We still have the larger um, inequities of life in rural South Asia. They're still playing out across these lines. Um, you might also note are there? No, no women, no women in this photo. And of course, it's women that do a lot of the actual agricultural land management. So we still have the larger issues of gender equality that are at play here. Even so, I think these institutions do, do a lot of that work in helping. Okay, we have a question from Anna, who's from Mexico in the chat box. And she's asking um, if organic growers are bothered that their seeds could accidentally have trans genes, and if this becomes an issue to continue planting organic cotton. So if the question is, great question, by the way, if the question is, are organic farmers in India really bothered by this? The answer is essentially no. Um, that is not really their concern. And part of that is uh, that it's, you really can't get, you can't go to a shop really and buy um, organic seeds. They don't, they're not there. No one's really selling them. There's, there's basically no market. And that means that organic programs will often sell these seeds directly or just give them to farmers directly. So there's no market decision there. The program, if you're growing organic and you're certified by some external development group, they give you the seed that you plant and you plant that seed. There is no choice. Um, and they stay up all night praying and hoping that there is no transgene uh, contamination, either through pollen, which is actually quite unlikely in cotton. Cotton pollen is heavy and cotton is a big sulfur. Um, or more likely because uh, the farmer just chooses to, to grow some GM seeds or gets confused and buys some because they're panicking because uh, a bunch of the seed doesn't germinate. Um, that's really more that problem where uh, you might have trans genes being grown or, or transgenic cotton being grown uh, in a ostensibly certified organic field. And so to police that, there are all manners of internal surveillance, usually conducted um, by these charismatic farmers, who is part of their, their job is to make sure that people really aren't planting these, uh, these outside seeds, that they're really sticking as closely as possible to the program, because that can sink. Uh, an entire certification and an entire value added chain. Um, huge amounts of paperwork are dealt uh, with certifying the seeds and with making sure that the farmer is indeed only planting the seeds that they're given. Uh, so this is a, a way bigger problem for the managers who have to manage that supply chain than it is for uh, at least the farmers that I spoke with. Okay, we're gonna sneak in one last question. I hope that's okay. So Zach, uh, go ahead. Yeah, actually, I was going to make a couple of observations, but actually, but looking at the chat box, uh, Jamie Choi has a one straightforward question that I'd like to hear your answer to, which is, how do seed companies even make a profit if there are th thousands of seeds uh, flooding the seed market in rural India? So I wonder what your perspective on that is. Yeah, that's a good question. And, and Zach, I appreciate your uh, magnanimous uh, giving up to, to someone else's work there. Um, it's even more complicated uh, than that. So, so the short answer is vertical integration. A lot of these companies uh, that are different seed uh, companies and offer different seed brands, they're really often splitting that market. So the same company will actually be owned by one parent company and will be selling things, um, selling different branded things so that no matter what you buy, you're buying from one of these key agribusiness companies. Um, the more complicated, slightly more complicated answer to that is, uh, say for instance, if we look here at this shop, all of these seeds cost exactly the same. 
Uh, India does not have a free market economy when it comes to agricultural inputs. By law, there is a maximum retail price. All of these seeds cost 930 rupees. There's no price break. There's no price differential. Um, and so there's really no economic reason for you as a farmer to buy one seed or another, uh, unless you think that the particular brand is going to be good in your field and give you a good response. And really, 930 rupees, it's not that expensive in the grand scheme of the larger farm budget. Um, as to how different seed companies make, uh, make a profit, that, that way of diversifying your brand portfolio. So one parent company will own lots of different companies. And in fact, all the money is really getting funneled to just a couple of places. That's part of that answer. And another part of that answer is that uh, with all this brand diversification, you've got 95% of farmers growing these, at least this particular kind of seed. And so there's lots of great reasons to invest heavily in marketing. You might get a fad seed for one year uh, and then you see this great return. 600 million buyers is, is not bad. All right, great. So um, unfortunately, we're out of time. Um, I just want to thank you, Andrew, again, uh, so much for, for joining us. This has been great. Um, if people can give some virtual emoji hands, hand wavings and, and applause, that would be great. Um, if you have additional questions, um, I, you know, reach out to Andrew. His email address is up there. And for our graduate students, you know, continue the conversation um, in the Moodle discussion um, over the next week. Um, and please join us next week uh, for Dr. Louis Rivers, who's going to be discussing issues around environmental justice. Um, so thank you again, Andrew, and hopefully we'll see everyone again next week.